Hey, greetings. Performance Reviews here, and I have the first Dyson here at the Vacuum Cleaner Museum. And we're going to tell the Dyson story, but I'm not going to tell it. I'm going to let Tom Gasco, the curator of the Vacuum Museum, tell it. Now, before we do that, I just want to note that at seven minutes, the audio quality will get better. This was at a convention, so some of it's a little bit loud with background noise. And I did change that halfway through filming this. I believe this one's serial number is 46, don't quote me, but it's, it's one of the original 500. Um, what he did when he showed this to the Japanese, and the Japanese would um, give him his royalties every month, the licensing fees, they wanted him to change it they, when they called it the G-Force. Notice that the head has no carpet height adjustment on it. Also, there's no metal sole plate. That was what they, the Japanese wanted, a metal sole plate to protect the brush uh, and a height saw. adjuster. Yep, that was his solution. Mr. I have spent my life inventing things, was to put a bottle brush in the middle of the tube. And you hear how the suction just, the, the airflow went from the end to the You know the story, don't you? Am I soon? Here's what happened. There was a picture of this in the TWA in-flight magazine because what he wanted to do was license his patents. The 500 he had made was just to prove to people that you could make them and sell them and they'd stay sold. So a TWA in-flight magazine had a picture of this weird looking machine. And the executives, a couple executives, uh, they were named in his book, from Amway saw this on the, while they were in flight in 84 and contacted him. And what he did was they gave him upfront money and they signed a contract that they were going to pay him X number of dollars for every one they made. But this design was going to be made in America by Bissell. So Mr. Dyson flew to America with this machine and talked to the executives at Bissell and they came out with, eventually, the Amway CMS 1000. That was Amway's version of this, beefed up for America. But once they had it done and it was working, Amway said to Mr. Dyson, we have decided not to make it. We would like our upfront money back and we'd like to cut up the contract. So he gave them their money back, they cut up the contract, and one month later, uh, the executive, uh, an executive at Sears, who they were trying to pitch the machine to as well, called them up and said, oh yeah, Amway's already brought out the machine, we've seen it. What? Yeah, and we went ahead and had Bissell make it. And they weren't going to pay him anything because he was just a guy. What was he going to do? He's a guy in England who had an invention. What's he going to do in America? We're Amway. You know, we can afford Amway. Amway is a company. Amway is a company. It's a multi-level marketing scam company. But in any event, when he found out that they, of course, brought them their version of his machine out and weren't paying him anything because he was a nobody from England, it took him five years and a number of U.S. attorneys and almost bankrupted the man in order to fight Amway. The irony, it was the money that he eventually won for all the Amways that they had produced, Amway had to pay him, you know, X number of dollars according to the original contract because they lost the lawsuit. He proved that he had actually invented it, not Amway, and that they owed him money. And they stole his he took the money and opened his factory in England. So ironically, had Amway not been such greedy bastards, the Dyson vacuum cleaner wouldn't even be here. <laughs> there would be no Dyson. There'd be no worldwide Dyson at all. But it was because of Amway's greed and the losing the lawsuit that Dyson was able to open a factory. Wow. And the DCO one which I have at home, the first Dyson uh, production upright with a Dyson was, uh, it came out. And it was all based on this machine. Did Phantom fit into the equation with Dyson? Because weren't they related somehow? Well, what happened was, uh, in 93, he opened the factory in England. In 1999, Johnson Wax approached him about taking his design and making a commercial machine out of it. So he contacted a manufacturer, I own his products in Welland, Ontario, Canada, about producing a machine as a commercial model for Johnson Wax. And they did, they brought it out, it was called the Vectron. The Vectron was here for two years, and Johnson Wax decided they were going to get out of the commercial floor care market. There wasn't enough money in there, the chemicals is their bread and butter. So they got out of it, but Iona had been making it, of course, the Vectron for Johnson Wax, and now they are producing it, and they're 
factory is still. So they got a contract with James Dyson uh, to manufacture, it was a 10 year contract, to manufacture what would become the Phantom Thunder. Yeah. <laughs> he signed the contract with them and he, they paid him for every Phantom vacuum they made. It was a licensing agreement. So basically the, the Phantom was the American Dyson. Version, yes, but, but Mr. Dyson had no say in how it was engineered. They used his patents and engineered it according to what they wanted for the American market and all they did was pay him for the, for the license on every machine. He had no say in it. He thought it was ugly. But here's the real problem. Phantom shot themselves in the foot. They got greedy. They were, yes. The HEPA, bearing in mind that the HEPA filter for the Phantom was $75 in the 90s. Dyson had, been, had invented a pre-motor filter that was better than that. <laughs> the MEMA, maximum efficiency, maximum airflow. It's today what we call the washable pre-motor filter. Okay, he had invented that. He went to Phantom and said, I have invented this fi the washable filters. You have the right, as the licensee of yes. my patents, to use that. They said, oh no, we don't want to use that because you may not have noticed it, but we are in the business of selling filters. Oh. He was uh -huh. pissed. Uh -huh. He said uh -huh. that to Alan Millman, who was the president of, of Iona, Phantom Industries, he said, when the contract is up, I will not be re-signing it. See, if they couldn't use his patents, they couldn't sell dual cyclone phantoms. Which, But while they were paying for his patents, he kept out of the North American market. So as soon as, as that contract was up and he didn't re-sign it, he was able to bring in Dyson's. And that happened in October of 2001. It was 20 years ago. Next month, the Dyson's came to America. In the late 1990s, when Dyson was the hit in Europe, because remember, they're not here in America yet. When they were hit in Europe, the Hoover Company could stand it no more. But you have to understand that Mr. Dyson in the 1980s took his patents to the Hoover Company and showed it to them. And they said bags are best. Bags will always be best. Uh, they didn't want a bagless cleaner. Years later, the Hoover Company's executive in an interview with a British magazine said that they wished they had actually bought the technology from him when he brought his patents so that they could have quashed it and put it on a shelf and it would never have been used. Which really pissed James Dyson off, as well it should. He spent years inventing this technology. So anyway, once he brought out the Dyson vacuum cleaner in 1993, it was an almost instantaneous hit. And then he brought out the DCO2, the canister, which sits on stairs. It looks like the Phantom Lightning. What happened was, the Hoover Company couldn't take it because they were taking so much market share from them, they decided to copy it. They copied the dual cyclone Dyson and they had it out for about six months before he sued them. But see, now Dyson was the most popular vacuum cleaner in Europe. They went almost overnight uh, to, be, to having such popularity, so now he had enough money to pay lawyers to fight it in British court. After almost nine months, the judge delivered the news to the Hoover Company that they had lost the patent infringement lawsuit and they owed him three and a half million dollars. On leaving the court after the judgment against the Hoover Company, Mr. Dyson picked up the then brand new DC-04 model and he held it above his head and he said, quote, this was on the, the, the London Times, this was the quote, the Hoover Company wouldn't give it the time of day. They said bags are best. Bags will always be best, and then they copied it. And he's holding it up because a three and a half million dollar lawsuit against the largest vacuum cleaner manufacturer, you know, in Europe, uh, was significant. But it validated his point that he had invented it, and you couldn't buy that technology from anybody except a Dyson. Besides, the Hoover they invented was complete crap. It was called the triple vortex. Here's how they claimed it was different. The Dyson goes. Here's dual cyclone from here to the bucket where it spins around, and then the air and dirt go to the cone-shaped one where it spins around. It then leaves the, uh, the cone-shaped uh, cyclone and goes down to the motor. What Hoover did right here, they reintroduced some of the air back to the high-efficiency cyclone. So it was always a third of your suction was being lost, spinning the air again and again and again and again, relentlessly through the second cyclone. That's what the triple vortex, and they thought, well, because we spin it three times and he does it twice, 
we can get away with it. Three and a half million dollars later, they found out they couldn't. It was a horrible vacuum and all the motors burnt up. Talk about low suction. This had more suction than the Hoover triple vortex, but the triple vortex had a cord rewinder. I bought one, brand new in 1999. I had it shipped to me when they first came out from England. I turned it on and it smelled like a funeral home. <laughs> Every time I used it, it smelled like a funeral home. It was horrible. This was a much better vacuum cleaner, which ain't saying a lot. But the DC-01, by the time Dyson got from 1984 to 1993, the machine had been improved tremendously, and he actually had electrostatic filtration before the motor and um, electrostatic after. And eventually, uh, the DC-01 HEPA would have a HEPA filter after the motor. So he was really trying, once they got into production, where they were actually selling machines, to make it as good as he could possibly make it. And it just really surprised him how, the, overnight, the company really took off. From 93 to 98, in five years, they became the largest manufacturer of vacuum cleaners in Europe. And today, they're one of the largest manufacturers of vacuums in the world. Their output. Think about Dyson's output today. They sell them everywhere in the world. Every country. Every single country. And his, um, the brushless motor technology used in the hand vax was really unique. Nobody had ever thought of brushless motors except Rainbow. And that was only because of, oh, don't get me started about Rainbow. <laughs> but anyway, that's the story of this. So we're going to go ahead and start this machine again because it really kind of is a unique sound. The company called Zanussi in Italy is the one who manufactured this to Mr. Dyson's patents. And I don't know what motor they used in it, but it must have been an Italian motor because they were in Italy. Zanussi is now a company that puts their name on products from the Swedish Electrolux company. So they're no longer a manufacturer. <laughs> And it's still brushing the carpet, you just don't really hear it. It's not a beating machine. But the carpets they have in England, well, there's no pad. They're not on a pad at all. Uh, the carpets lay on floors. They may be wall-to-wall -wall carpets, but they lay on hardwood floors. And they're, they're wool. The, the composition of the carpet is so different than what we have. They have no nylon carpets at all. This is why straight suction Henry's will clean them. So now you know a little bit more about the very first one. I walked into the curry store, and there he was standing there. It said in the newspaper ad, come meet the man who invented the bagless vacuum cleaner. The man who invented the Rex Air, which was the first bagless vacuum cleaner and that didn't lose suction. You know the Rex Airs weren't supposed to use water. They were dual cyclone like the Dyson. <laughs> and that was back in the early 1930s. So, the man who invented that uh, was dead, has long been dead, so I went to see the corpse. I walk in and I said to him, <laughs> he sa I said, hello, I'm Tom Gasco from America. He goes, hello, I'm Joy Ms. Dyson. And I said, I collect vacuum cleaners. He goes, nobody collects vacuum cleaners. <laughs> and then he showed me this machine and I said, well, I, uh, I, I like it. He said, it's the first vacuum cleaner in the world that has no bag and no loss of suction. I said, you mean other than the Rex Air? He said, the Rex Air. I said, you know, the rainbow. What's a rainbow, he said. Well, they never sold them in England. He had no idea it existed. Why would he have ever seen a rainbow? He wouldn't have. If he would have and had heard the story of how the rainbow was invented, the Rex Air is to be a vacuum cleaner with no bag and no loss of suction because Airway had the patent on the bag. <clears throat> so they wanted to eliminate it. Had he known that story, he would have never claimed this was the world's first. But he knows now because I sent him a rainbow. You know, you'll notice at my house tonight, you're going to see a lot of machines that are Dysons that you've never seen before and won't again. He made 250 Dyson canisters, DCO2s, out of recycled plastic, and it was called the Recyclone, and they're green. Uh, I have one. We can plug it in tonight. There, are, there were 250 of them. How many do you think are still here? In fact, Mr. Dyson and I believe we're the only two people who still have one of these. Well, they were, there wasn't that many, and they were, there was no repair parts, and they were sold to be used. And, of course, there were no repair parts. <laughs> he has one at the factory in a glass case, and then I have this one. And I would have thought 30 years, almost 40 years later, how many of them existed that were ever used. 
Because if you think that bottle brush kept the dirt out of the motor, you're very wrong. <laughs> that bottle brush didn't do anything but stop a couple of threads. <laughs> so I, I really absolutely don't believe that there's more than, if there's the his and mine and there may be one or two more in the world, but certainly there can't be very many. Whoever bought it, bought it to use it. They bought it to clean their house. Well, and they broke. Look at the cheap plastic. It's cheap, cheap, cheap. You know, we complain about China all the time. Uh, the Chinese weren't the first people to invent cheap. <clears throat> you, you, a vacuum cleaner is worth whatever you pay to manufacture it. Well, he was paying to have this machine made by another company, so they were charging him out the ass. You know, in, in Japan, this vacuum cleaner was the equivalent of $2,000 in 1986. There was a, a status symbol in Japan. People bought them so you could see them, not because they actually vacuumed with them. And remember, it had a height adjuster and a metal bottom plate, so it had been improved from this one. So, um, yeah, that's the story of the Dyson. Oh, <clears throat> vacuum collecting. He said to me, I've invented the most powerful vacuum cleaner ever made. So I bought it. It was 300 British no, 200 British pounds, 300 American dollars, 75 for the plane ticket to get it home. Because that box, he had had them boxed up with the handle in place. So think of the size of the box. The airline didn't know I was bringing this box home. <laughs> so I got it home and I used it twice. And in th within three weeks. And he called me up and he said, and I quote, what do you think? And I said, well, number one, it's not the most powerful vacuum cleaner I've ever seen. <laughs> and you can see why. I said, number two, I wish you would put a bag in it because it took me so long to clean the machine after I was done cleaning the rug. And he said, and I quote, if I put a bag in it, no one would buy it over a Hoover. Not the most powerful vacuum cleaner I've ever seen. He said, it doesn't matter. He said, all that matters is that they can see the dirt spin because then they will believe. And see, what we're doing is we're, we're, you have to make someone believe that the dirt that they can see spinning is their filth. And the only thing that can get that filth out of the rug is something like this because you can see it. If you think about it, you know when you see a person vacuum their carpet with a rainbow and the water gets really dirty in about five minutes, you go, oh my God, look at that filth. There's probably two tablespoons of dirt in that water bin because it doesn't take much dirt to get water dirty. But your eye says, oh my God, look at this filth. And then, of course, when you're done, you pick up the dirty water basin and you say, oh my God. <clears throat> Cut open a vacuum bag and empty it onto a newspaper and you will have picked up a lot more dirt. But you can't see it. I always thought that there was a vacuum bag manufacturer that made a clear strip that went down the disposable bag. So when you opened up the machine, you could actually see through the clear strip in the middle of the disposable bag how full it was. You could see it visually. They discontinued them, you know, a long time ago. But I thought that was always a good idea to be able to see the dirt because it gives you the visual effect of being able to see it without actually having to touch it. Uh, getting it out of the vacuum and then putting it in the trash can. Uh, don't put any trash on top of it because all the dirt will come out the top of the bag and you have dust coming out of your trash can. So I've always thought a closed bag that sealed the dirt inside the machine, like an Electrolux. Oh, hey, it was invented in 1952, and they stole it from Airway, who invented it in 37. I've always thought those two designs of disposable bags were the very best. You couldn't get the bag in an Airway wrong. You can't get the bag in an Electrolux wrong. Every other vacuum I've ever seen in the world, people have, in fact, gotten the bags in wrong. Big thank you to Mid-Missouri Vacuum, which is where Tom Gasco has the museum in the back of his vacuum store. If you're ever in Missouri, I suggest you check this out. I'll put a link to this in the description below. Thanks for watching. Consider a subscription if you like this sort of content. 